and welcome to this edition of Talk Vietnam. Have you ever heard of painting to songs or live illustration to opera and ballet? Well, our guest today in this week's edition of Talk Vietnam has really dedicated his time to perfecting this art. His name is James Mehu. He is an author, a concert presenter and storyteller, and also an illustrator, and he's from the United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Mr. Mehu, for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Yes, yeah, so if we may start now, can I please ask, what is the type of work that you do? Well, principally my work is based around art. I went to art school and I trained as an illustrator. So from there, many paths have opened up and I, I illustrate books, as you described. I also sometimes write them. And from there, I've moved into education and also concert presenting, working with music. Most of my work is built around the things that fascinate me, the things that I love, the things that I'm passionate about and so the things that I want to share. And almost all of my work has been aimed at children. When were you first kind of exposed to this type of art form, would you say? Do you mean the drawing to music specifically? Yes, the drawing to music. Well, even as a child, even when I was quite young, I first discovered certain pieces of classical music. My parents had a few old records that I would listen to. And very often I found music that, that had a story attached to it. And once I found out the story, I was inspired to create some art to go along with that. So even as a child, I drew along. I was inspired, I suppose, by films like Fantasia, Disney's Fantasia. Mm. And uh, the idea that, that music tells a story lends itself, therefore, to creating images. Yes, exactly. It's, about, it's almost like using illustration in order to visually um, you know, tell the music. Yes, that's exactly how it works. Because music isn't just a nice tune. It's, it's very often much more than that. These composers were inspired by specific legends and myths. I tried to research the story that inspired the composer. I tried to present these concerts with absolute integrity to the composer's intentions. So I tried to give the music back to its original story and then find an illustration, a visual a counterpart that I can create live on stage to help the children understand what the music is about and make it much more interesting and fun for them. Yes. Let's go back to one of your kind of signature series, and that is the Katie series. Yes. Tell us about this uh, series and how it became kind of your signature. Well, what happened was uh, I went to art school. I decided I wanted to do something within the arts. While I was there, one of the many projects we had to do was to try and develop a, a children's story. So I thought, well, what were the things that happened to me as a child? What, what do I remember? What's exciting about being a child? And I had a particular memory of going to London with my grandmother and my sister. Her name's Katie. We didn't live near London. This wasn't an everyday thing. It was a big event. trip, a big, a big yeah. event. A big trip to the city. Absolutely. So I remember it very vividly. And we went to museums and galleries. I saw dinosaur skeletons in the museum. I saw beautiful paintings in the gallery. And this memory inspired the story of Katie and her adventures in in most of the time, she's in the art gallery, but sometimes she visits other museums too. Yes, and she actually goes, you know, into the paintings. And we actually have uh, an example here. Can you please show us this? We have uh, this particular example, which is Katie and uh, the water lily pond, which is probably inspired by Monet. It is, is that right? absolutely, yes. Can you please show us? Well, with pleasure. So in, in this story, uh, we see Katie uh, with her grandma arriving at the gallery and as always in these stories grandma's a bit tired and she falls asleep leaving Katie at liberty to explore the gallery 
and she sees the paintings and she can't resist climbing inside them. <laughs> so uh, at this point I have to try and pastiche these uh, amazing paintings by these great masters, which yes. can be very difficult. And uh, she goes in and out of the different paintings, creating havoc and chaos in the gallery. <laughs> uh, but in the end, all comes right somehow. And with each story, I have to try and find five paintings, which I think will be child-friendly and will lend themselves to, to storytelling. So that was the beginning. And uh, yes, it spawned a whole series. There are 13 titles about Katie now. And I never expected that to happen. So it's been a wonderful adventure for me, as well as for Katie. What has been some of the feedback that you've gotten from the Katie series? Um, what do you think you know, impresses people the most, especially children the most? The books are used a lot in schools, so teachers find them helpful to engage children in terms of uh, finding ways of using art, both for its own sake, but also for literacy. But I think the most exciting thing is when I get letters from children, or even from their parents. Sometimes I get letters from parents saying, you know, my children are begging me to go to an art gallery because of your books, thank <laughs> you so much. Or I took my five-year-old to, to a gallery and he was running around saying, look, there's a Monet, look, there's a Van Gogh, look, that picture's wow. by Leonardo da Vinci. And the parents are so proud and the children see the paintings not as boring, dull, dry things in a museum, but, but something they're familiar with, something they can have an adventure with, something they can imagine about. Exactly. Illustrator, author, concert presenter, storyteller, James Mayhew was born with a crayon in his hand. His first children's book, Katie's Picture Show, was published in 1989, and 12 more Katie titles have followed, introducing great works of art to children. The best-selling series can now be found in museums and galleries all over the world. James is also the creator of the much-loved Ella Bella Ballerina series and many other books, including Koch Girl's Tales, Miranda the Explorer and Boy. In 1994, he received the New York Times Book Illustration Award for Jenny Correct's The Boy at the Cloth of Dreams. James has written for BBC Television, Driver Dance Story Train and Melody, and in 2011, he was the first illustrator to be chosen to appear on the BBC's Authors Live series for Scottish Book Trust. Now, alongside uh, your work in publishing, you have devised and performed in hugely successful series of concerts for children, um, combining live classical music, storytelling and art. What first motivated you to do this? Uh, it was it was through a, uh, a literature festival in Britain, and I was telling a story called The Firebird. It's a Russian tale. And when I tell stories, I usually like to draw pictures at the same time. And the organizer said, this is great. We have the, the words. We have a painting. All we need now is the, is the music by Stravinsky. And I said, well, you, you, mean a, you mean a CD or something? And they said, no, no. We, we know an orchestra who wants to do a, oh, a family wow. concert. So they introduced me to this first orchestra, and uh, we weren't sure how it would work, whether we could project the art, because I painted an easel, and we needed to project it onto a screen, like a cinema screen above the orchestra. Um, but they found a way to do it. It was simple technology, and we tried, and, uh, and everyone loved it. And I've been doing that now for... Well, this will be the 11th year, and it's expanded and expanded with more and more orchestras, including an orchestra from Singapore, in fact, and more and more musicians. Sometimes I work with string quartets or even solo musicians, and as you said, sometimes with, with big, big orchestras. And it's, it's kind of terrifying to walk on stage and see the <laughs> audience there and, and know that you've got to, got to remember what you want to paint and how you're going to paint it and which brush you need and which colour you need. There's a lot of preparation. You also need to remember the story because I've had to research the story as well. Mm. So it's, it's a big investment of my time, but I love it. I absolutely love it. And I believe in the whole project so passionately. So it's, it's, um, it's something I can never say no to. Yeah.
How is the atmosphere in one of these live performances? Um, is it more that you prepare beforehand, you try to remember the painting, or are there any moments of spontaneity um, during these live performances? Always lots of spontaneity. You have a, a fundamental concept of, of what the content of the image might be based on the story that you've researched and what the music suggests to you. But however much you prepare, it's always different when you walk on stage and you see the audience there and that little bit of fear comes along and you suddenly start to, to panic and think, oh, maybe this won't work, maybe that won't work. And in the heat of the moment, I very often change my mind. Sometimes I can't find a brush or a colour in the darkness of the theatre. Mm. So there is improvisation. Every single time I do it, it's different. Yes. Have you, do you have any kind of... Uh funny stories about, you know, during this process of, you know, you, you just said looking for colors in the dark or any stories like that that's kind of uh, um, accidental on stage. <laughs> well, well, certainly all, all of the things you just um, reminded me of, of, of not finding certain things in the, in, the, in the gloom, but there was one occasion when I was working with a, a, a children's orchestra and a children's choir at the Royal Albert Hall in London, which is a very prestigious, yes. very big venue, a huge audience. And uh, I was painting to a world premiere piece um, about a highwayman, a highwayman robber, who was actually a woman in disguise. Mm. So this was a, a new piece of music. It was the first time it had been performed. And I wanted to paint a girl's face that then turned into a, a, a wicked uh, highwayman's face. And the ink dripped and it dripped all the way down the face. And I thought, oh. why does that have to happen here in the Royal Albert Hall in front of <laughs> thousands of people? And I thought, I'm not going to be defeated. So I got a clean brush, and I managed to turn the drip into a completely different <laughs> face, which actually worked very well with the music. So I saved it. But it was the most terrifying moment when I saw that drip. I thought, oh, no. But yes. There's usually a way out. There's nearly always an answer to a problem like that. <laughs> exactly, and that's the wonderful thing about creative art. You it can, is, it is. You can kind of work your way around uh, to, to make the piece in the end. Yes. So we talked a lot about what it's like to kind of illustrate live to music, and we actually pre prepared some music here today in our Talk Vietnam oh, studio, so yes. that hopefully you can um, illustrate how that experience is for our audience. So if, okay, I would you please um, kind of <laughs> illustrate live for us? It would be an absolute honor to do that for you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Please. Okay. That's great.
in the process of painting, trying to remember uh, the painting, you also had to follow the music, is that right? Yes, and I try to paint in a way that captures the, the ebb and flow of the music. So if it's very elegant and, and gentle music, then I'll try to use my brush in an elegant, almost calligraphic way, perhaps. Then when the music is more dramatic, then my brush strokes become more animated. It's, it's, it's not choreographed in advance, but I try to choreograph it on yes. the occasion to try and match the mood of the music. So the children have that sense of me underlining that, that something interesting is happening in the music. Yes, it's juggling a lot of skills at the same time, it seems, you know. I suppose, yes. I think for me it doesn't feel that way because I'm very used to the idea of, of creating a visual response either, either to words or music. So for me, creating images, painting and drawing, it's a very natural way of communicating. Uh, how have you know the audiences respond to some of these live performances? Uh, what do you th they usually expect, and how do they feel normally coming out of the theater? There's always a wonderful buzz at the end of, the, of a show. It's lovely to come out into the foyer and, and meet the children, uh, usually still in my costume, whether I've dressed as Sinbad <laughs> or one of the other characters. So it, it's a it's a lovely atmosphere. There's a, there's a real sense of an occasion. I think I get lots and lots of lovely comments from from people. But you know, some of the comments that count the most to me are, have been from the musicians themselves. And sometimes I've had uh, members of the orchestra say to me, do you know, I've been playing that music for 20 years. I had no idea that that is what the music was supposed to be about. So mm -hmm. I'm even educating orchestras as well as children. That's wonderful. And that's great feeling. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of, a lot of uh, messages uh, conveyed within just one kind of uh, work. Yeah, I'm curious about the, the process of you researching into the music background. Is that, is that a difficult job? I mean, some of these classical pieces have been around for ages, and sometimes yes. it's probably hard to know the origin. Sometimes it's extremely hard, and it depends on the individual piece of music. Sometimes if it's something very obvious, like, I don't know, perhaps uh, the William Tell Overture, which is a piece I've painted to, comes from an opera by Rossini. So we have the opera story. So mm. it's clear what the story is. And that's an easy thing to adapt. But when you're working with something like, well, even Scheherazade that I've already mentioned, this piece, Rimsky Korsakov, the composer, he gave titles to the sections of the music but they're very vague. So one section, for example, is called The Young Prince and the Young Princess. Now, the Arabian Nights has thousands of princes and princesses. Yes. We don't know which one. Which one? <laughs> so I had to read his autobiography and re read wow. some music critics' analysis of the music and, and make my own conclusions and then go to the Arabian Nights and, and read very full versions and find a story that I felt matched the music best. Uh, other composers, like uh, Vivaldi, when he wrote The Four Seasons, he wrote very clear instructions actually into the score alongside the notes. Uh, bar by bar, he describes what his notes are supposed mm. to be representing, whether it's uh, flies in the air on a hot summer's wow. day or a storm or snowflakes. That's very helpful. It's, yeah. it's, it's wonderfully it's helpful, Visual yes. descriptions. <laughs> he, he, was, he was perfect at it. <laughs> yes, it seems like this that type of job really encompasses all different realms, whether it be history, culture, and not just limited to art and music. It's very cross-curricular, which is why I love using it in schools and why I wish more schools and more teachers and parents, anybody working with children, would consider investigating this more because it's, it's all the things you described. It's geography as well because we're looking at composers from different countries and stories from different cultures. So it's very diverse. Uh, although Rimsky Korsakov is Russian, Scheherazade is Arabic, we're covering many, many continents here. It's, uh, it's a wonderful way of, of reminding ourselves that music really is a universal language. Yeah. Before each concert, you would probably have to, um, you, do you have to practice with the musicians? It's, uh, it's not always possible. Usually it is, but sometimes uh, you have to uh, just, um, as we say in England, you have to wing it. Uh, <laughs> but that's not the ideal. I begin at home with, with a CD mm -hmm. and just listen to some recorded performances. And then I go into the rehearsals with the orchestra and listen to how the conductor is going to interpret it. Every conductor, every orchestra, every musician takes things slightly differently. and. Sometimes there are repeats in music, and sometimes there are cuts in music. So I need to know exactly what edition is being performed as well, because otherwise I could be in a terrifying situation of just running out of time and not completing a painting. Because the real magic is if you can complete the painting as the music ends. Yes. 
Um, now, in his trip, very short trip to Hanoi this time, about three days, James Mayhew has taken the time to have a little exchange with the children in Hanoi and to foster more in the little ones a reading culture. We'll get a chance to follow Mr. Mayhew in the following to see what this exchange was like. Natural History Museum to see the dinosaur skeletons. Drawing and telling stories, all at the same time. After only a few simple strokes of drawing, the image of a dinosaur appears. Now look what happens when I draw one more line on his eye. See how his face changes. James Mayhew, considered one of the most respected illustrators in the world, continues to intrigue the young audiences with his masterful painting technique and captivating storytelling skills. He was snoring so loudly the whole hill shook. Who can snore like a dragon? Can you make a noise like a dragon sleeping? A bit like that but louder. Who can make that noise? Very good. James Mayhew also introduced to the children his most renowned illustrated series. The main character in the series, Katie, embarks on adventures into the art masterpieces of artists like Monet or Van Gogh. But perhaps what captures the children's attention the most is James Mayhew's live illustrations to music. James wanted to let the young audiences have a try at the experience, yet this seems like no easy task. Cái mà các con thích nhất là nhìn 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 diễn giả vừa nói chuyện này, sau lại vừa vẽ con rất rất thích. Thế nhưng mà khi mà mà bảo các con vẽ lại thì thì các con cũng rất là lúng túng. Thế nhưng mà đấy cũng là một cái cách để cho con học. After the initial hesitation, the first drawings, fresh and creative, came to life. What do you like most about the picture that you just made? I very love the boat. Two, three, raise your picture and... Pizza! Do you have any kind of advice for teachers out there? Um, how to engage their students more in not only a reading culture, but also learning more about art and music and uh, creative learning. Mm. I think creative learning is absolutely essential with children because they're just instinctively creative. And art isn't just one thing. It isn't just pictures that hang on walls. Art is all around us. Art is everything. It's the chairs we're sitting on, the clothes they're wearing, the, 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 the cars we might drive. It's theatre and cinema and television. All these things involve creativity and design and art. So. I think celebrating art more in the classroom is something that is uh, a project I would really encourage teachers to look at. Most children learn in a very visual way and obviously we want children to be good at literacy but actually you can use visual aids to help them understand literacy mm. even before they're ready to read and write so they can start to become aware of how stories work, how the sequence of a story works in terms of beginning and the middle and the end purely through, through, through visual tools. A lot of picture books written for children don't work just with the words. If you took the words away and read them on their own, they wouldn't make sense. You need those pictures. So in the same way that you have that experience by looking at, at picture books, I think children can learn from that and teachers can learn from that by allowing them to develop their literacy with image. Mm. So storytelling from image or writing from image is a, is a wonderful thing. I also think that for, for a lot of children, uh, it's quite intimidating learning to read and write, and I remember that feeling. I didn't find it very easy. I wasn't a natural. Some kids were. Some kids started reading and writing very, very easily. I didn't. And for me, the thing that attracted me to books, the thing that made me want to go to the library and sit down and open books and look at them, it was the pictures. Mm. So I think there's a tendency to think that, oh, well, a child's doing well at reading, we don't need picture books anymore. They're onto chapter books. They're onto mm. books without pictures. People see that as some kind of achievement, and I think that's completely wrong. I think there are so many quite sophisticated picture books out there yes. by wonderful, wonderful artists, which are aimed at even older children. And in any case, there's no harm in going back to books you read when you were a little bit younger and enjoying them again yes. and again 
and again. And, again. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it, it adds an element to, to just reading lines on a page. And as we said again, everyone has a different way of reading and learning. Um, yes. to, to the teachers out there, how do you think they can um, encourage or learn more about the art of storytelling in order to encourage that in their students? You know, this is a wonderful part of the world for storytelling. You have such incredible legends and myths here, and it's, it's all there waiting to be used. So I would say to anybody, go out, find these stories. You probably know them already. Remind yourself of them. Use them in the classroom. And if you don't want to use those, think of other ways of telling stories. We're telling stories now, talking to each other. Mm -hmm. The woman you saw dropping her shopping outside the store earlier today, go home and tell your kids about that. That's a story. Mm. The story your neighbor told you about the cat that ran away. It's a story. Stories are everywhere. Don't feel you've got to stick with a published book all the time. There are many, many ways of being a storyteller. Don't feel you've got to do it in a formal way or be particularly good at it. It's about sharing. It's about communicating. It's about laughing. And it's about that bond between both a parent and a child or a teacher and a child. And it's about sharing words and celebrating the magic and the power in language. To James, beside illustrating books and teaching children, inspiring and exchanging ideas with teachers is also an important mission. During his time in Hanoi, James held a workshop for English teachers on the importance of storytelling, especially storytelling with visuals and music. Um, so I learned quite a few things. I learned about how uh, how we could use music to influence art, and we can use that. We can do that easily in the classroom. Um, and I learned that um, sometimes it's not always about the words in the story that tell the story. It's sometimes more important about the visual and the the images. Uh, they tell more of the story than just the words. It's really interesting. I feel inspired to use some of the ideas he gave us in my classroom. Um, and I feel like I should try a lot more creative things with storytelling with the children. So I learned a lot. Um, I learned that um, it's nice to make it more visual and also um, with the music as well. That was really interesting. That's not something that I'd thought, I would have thought to do before. Um, so I'd definitely be trying that. One interesting part of the workshop was that teachers could try hands-on activities and experience storytelling themselves. Their task was to illustrate a fairy tale as music played in the background. Everyone drew the tale together without deciding who would draw what and without any order of time or space. The teachers returned to their childhood and let their imaginations run free. Together, they experienced visual storytelling in which each individual part of the story combined to make a fairy tale more unique. For children, a lot of the best learning comes from making activities entertaining, making it fun. I like the idea that children can create their own stories or learn to remember a story by drawing it themselves. I think that's really interesting. Um, because it, it needs to be fun, it needs to be interesting, and kids love stories. So if you kind of hook them with something interesting like storytelling, then they're much more engaged throughout the lesson. Through the workshop, teachers could understand the importance of storytelling using visual and music in teaching and learning a language. As a parent myself, to a toddler who can barely oh keep his attention on one thing, <laughs> um, how would you be able to, you know, what advice would you have for a parent in order to um, encourage, you know, more attention on on art or on creative learning when their attention is seemingly very s dispersed. <laughs> I think we live in an era where we try to control the education of children a lot and actually creativity is something that we can't really control. Mm. I grew up in a very small village and there wasn't really very much to do there. There wasn't television 24 hours, we didn't have the internet then. So I had time to just play and when I say play I mean I mean draw and be creative. So I would say to any parent, find a space in your house where a child can be relaxed, 
where there are art materials just waiting there. Mm. Don't make it a big deal. Don't put them away in the cupboard yes. and wait for a special occasion to get them out. Just have paper and pencils Can and crayons. Can provide them with an environment? Exactly. So that whenever they feel like it, it's there. And don't make it a prescriptive thing. Mm. Don't say, OK, today we're going to sit down and we're going to draw a horse. Yeah. This is how you draw a horse. Horses are hard. Mm. You need to think about this. You need to think about that. No, let them draw what they want to. Let them experiment and play. Play with the crayons. Play with different materials. Give them all sorts of materials, paints. Um, they can perhaps try printmaking uh, with cutting into uh, potatoes and stamping, all sorts of different kinds of creative uh, play with children, but make it available to them so that mm. it's there and they can just touch it and go for it whenever they feel in the mood. Yes, you, you know, you just mentioned your own childhood. Tell us about uh, you know, your parents and how they were able to foster in you this love for art and this love for kind of the freedom in play. You know, my father wasn't at all creative. He couldn't even draw a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was a pilot in, in the Royal Air Force and he flew airplanes, which I found very uh, uh, inspiring as a child to hear about. But my mother was quite creative and uh, she used to make beautiful pictures out of fabric and paint a little bit. So I was aware of, of um, the possibilities of being creative. There were paints and things in the house. But I think the turning point for me was a Christmas when I was about eight or nine years old and my Christmas present that year was a wooden box my father had made. I still have it, I still keep things in it. And I remember opening the lid of this big wooden box and inside was everything a young art artist could want. There was paper, there was pencils, there was transfers, there were stickers, there were felt tips, there were uh, uh, rubbers and, uh, and just everything, everything you could possibly think to use. And it was wonderful for two reasons. Firstly, because there were all these great things to use and play with. There was glue and glitter, everything. <laughs> But also, it was wonderful because it was a clear message to me and it was saying, my parents were saying, we know you love art and we want, we want you to feel encouraged, we want you to carry on and do more. So after that I had this big box, it was in my bedroom and it was just there whenever I wanted it. And I used that box until it was empty and then I refilled it again and again and again. And you still have it today? I still have it today and do you know what, that is the one specific Christmas present that I can remember. I'm sure I had many other things. I'm sure I had trains and, and castles mm. and, and, and all sorts of other things over the years. I don't remember them. But the one present I really, really remember is that box full of art materials. Yes. Do you um, spend a lot of time drawing in each day? What does a day in the life of uh, James <laughs> Mayhew look like? <laughs> I try to draw very regularly because it's like anything else. It's like uh, maybe being a dancer or a singer. If you don't keep those, those uh, muscles flexible, the drawing muscles, uh, you do get rusty. I like to try and keep drawing as much as possible. Although I've been doing all sorts of events, I was drawing on the plane on the way to oh. Hanoi. Even in that situation, I tried to find time and, and an opportunity to do some drawing just to keep it fluid, just to keep it coming forward. And out of those drawings, ideas spring. New stories will grow.
at uh, you know Talk Vietnam today prepared for you a little quiz okay. Um, okay. about yourself. Okay. So it's just <laughs> really short, um, you know, little uh, snippets so okay. that the audience can get a chance to know more well, about our a, illustrator James Mayhew. That's a crazy thing to be doing, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yes. So the first question is: Do you feel older or younger than your actual age? Oh, much, 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 much younger. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm about 11 years old, probably, <laughs> on a good day. Most what, days I'm more like seven. <laughs> yes. What do you think makes you feel so young at heart? I think I'm, I think I'm somebody who, in general, is what we call a cup half full. Do you have that metaphor in yes, Vietnam? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I don't believe in being negative about things. I think I'm a positive person. Next question now. Um, what is the best advice anyone has ever given to you? That you don't have to be like everybody else. Yes. That was uh, something my mother taught me when I was quite young. I wanted to go to the cinema to see a particular film that was uh, rated higher than my age. And all my friends were going. My mother wouldn't let me. And uh, I was very angry. And she just said, you don't have to be like everyone else. You, you can just be you. Don't be a sh sheep. Be the shepherd. Mm. I've always remembered that. Yes. What has life taught you, if you can sum it up? That we should seize the day. Carpe diem is my motto. Uh, life is short, and uh, we should um, live our lives to the full, do all the things we want to do. Don't put things off until tomorrow. Uh, I, I really believe that. If I've got something I want to do, I jump on it, and I do it, and I enjoy it. Uh, I didn't used to feel like that. I used to uh, think very differently. But then uh, I realized that life was passing, and I wanted to start uh, having all sorts of interesting experiences. It's what has given me the courage to get on a plane and be here today. Yes, it's wonderful to live in the moment. Yes. Yes, thank you for that short quiz. <laughs> You're very welcome. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mihu. It's my pleasure. For your time here on Talk Vietnam and coming to the country and sharing your love um, and this journey of fostering the love for the arts in children and adults. Well, thank you for inviting me into the studio today. It's been an absolute honor to, to meet you and to be here. So thank you very much. Yes, all the best of luck in your future endeavors. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That has also wrapped up this edition of Talk Vietnam, a very fun edition with illustrator, author, and concert presenter James Mayhew to learn more about his journey in kind of encouraging the love for arts in children. Thank you very much for tuning in on this edition. We'll see you more next time on Talk Vietnam. Goodbye for now.